Welcome to Civil Discourse, a podcast where participants are free to share their ideas, empathize with other perspectives, and who intend to advance to a better solution to fix a societal ill. We will focus on topics that are particularly complicated. At a time where information is from sources more opinionated than ever, our mission is to find solutions and goals to accelerate the nation's progress with cultural impunity. I'm your host, Todd Furness. Welcome to today's episode of Civil Discourse, hosted by Todd Furness. I'm your host, Todd Furness. I'm glad to have you here and uh, appreciate your listening. As always, if you like uh, this content, please like, share, and subscribe. We welcome your support and we need your support in order to make this uh, something that people appreciate. I want to talk today a little about uh, an expansion of an idea that was founded a long time ago. So uh, briefly, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about HSAs, about empowering consumers, about moving more money into consumer uh, control, and uh, as importantly, childcare, uh, and how we can help people get back into the workforce. So with no further ado, let's go straight into it. Today, we're not going to have a guest. I just want to talk about this issue because I think it's really important. Uh, the issue we have right now is we have uh, a problem with people rejoining the workforce. Labor participation rate for the United States is very low. Uh, it's not nearly what we would like it to be. And it needs to be better in order for the economy to be sustainably successful. So if you take a look at it, uh, women have been particularly adversely affected by uh, the, the movement away from the workforce, meaning that they have left the workforce more than others. And as a result of that, participation rate for women in the workforce is down uh, below 58%. That's not good. Uh, and having said that, it's been on a gradual decline really since March of 2001. So this is not a new phenomenon. But the driving factors for uh, women returning to the workforce include the issue of childcare. And right now, childcare is too expensive for many people to afford. And for many people, the business case just doesn't make sense for people to go back to work when they have to pay the cost of childcare and the amount of money they would make by going back to work only marginally uh, covers the cost of childcare. So how do we make this better? Uh, I would submit that one of the things we want is a, as a fundamental tenet is we would like to have people to have the opportunity to go back to work uh, and to rejoin the workforce or to join the workforce as the case may be. So that's thing number one. Principle or thing number two and principle number two is that uh, we would like to empower people to pay for child care in the best way possible. Uh, ideally, that's with tax protected tax protected funds. So can we do that? Can we figure out a way to allow people to pay for child care with tax protected funds? This is likely more efficient than it is if you get a child tax credit. And it's likely more powerful because the ability to pay for child care is in the hands of the purchaser. There's privy of contract with the provider. And as a result of that, you've got a good uh, opportunity for a good negotiation to take place and for the direct relationship between two parties to occur, which is what we want in private contracting such as this. So uh, if, if those are the ideals that we want to employ, then I would submit that the best way to do that is to uh, expand the role of health savings accounts to include the ability to pay for childcare out of your health savings account. Now, for those of you who don't recall, health savings accounts are monies that you as an individual put into an account on a tax protected basis. Now, what that means is, and I've done a podcast on this earlier in my book, The 60% Solution uh, speaks to HSAs at length. But what, what that means is that as an individual puts money into a health savings account, that money reduces their taxable income, meaning it's not subject to taxation. So the money that you have in the tax in the health savings account, not only is it not subject to tax when you put it into the account, but any value that's created by virtue of an investment of that money into anything from a money market fund to a stock or a bond earns money also on a tax protected basis. It's not subject to tax. So 
that's positive as well. And you can pay for these, you can pay for healthcare expenses broadly uh, using your health savings account dollars. This was something that was put in place by Dr. John Goodman, whom I've had on the show, a uh, very smart guy. And it got implemented under the George W. Bush administration back in 2003. So the idea of tax savings accounts has been around for a long time. The idea of a health savings account specifically has been around since 2003. And the things that you can pay for using your health savings account has expanded gradually over time. This is something that is determined by the Internal Revenue Service. So what we would want to see, ideally, is that the health savings accounts would allow for greater savings to be put into the account and that the utility of those accounts be broadened to include child care. Now, there is something I want to make sure that everybody understands. There is something called a, an FSA-DC. So FSA stands for Flexible Savings Account. Dash DC means dependable care, dependent care, I'm sorry, dependent care. So what that means is that you can use a flexible savings account to pay for dependent care. And this became popular a little bit because it allowed people to pay for uh, the care of adult parents uh, when uh, they had become infirm or needed some help and some support. And what the difference is here is that the flexible spending, uh, the spe flexible spending account is really something that's designed for companies to own. And so if the employee doesn't use it all, that means they don't get to keep whatever's left over and it doesn't roll to the next year, it has to be funded by the company. It's owned by the company uh, itself. So uh, not really as helpful in my view because it doesn't really encourage the kinds of behaviors we'd like to see. And for reasons I don't really understand, the concept of dependent care has not been applied yet to health savings account. I think there's another aspect of this, which is also very limiting, which is that the, the health savings accounts max out, the maximum contribution you can make is $7,200 per couple. So if you think about the cost of childcare, it's gonna be likely much more than $7,200 in the course of the year. So we ought to really expand these health savings accounts uh, to be much greater. And we ought to encourage this to be a benefit that's funded in, in part by uh, employees, but maybe also employers, if that's possible. Well, we can certainly expand the rules to accommodate that if, if, uh, if it is deemed appropriate. And I would submit it is appropriate. It is important. And we do need to figure out a way to expand the care so that we have more consumers buying child care uh, and getting child care for their children. Uh, and I would also submit for, for our parents as well, where they need support. Uh, so let's take the concept of the dependent care and let's apply it into HSAs in addition to FSAs so that we can uh, really take care of our needs and we can expand the economy by, by helping people get back into the workforce. Again, the idea here is we want to really empower consumers and the people who are taking the brunt of this uh, with regard to uh, kids not being able to go to school with parents being at home because they're ill, uh, or infirm uh, with regard to any number of other things that are going on in households across America right now, given the continuing vagaries of COVID and the anxieties that uh, school administrations and government administrations have around uh, this disease, we have to figure out a way to work around it. Uh, this is not going to go away anytime soon. We're going to have variations of COVID for uh, likely forever. Uh, our reaction to it will, will change as we uh, learn how to cope with it perhaps more effectively and as more people become uh, vaccinated or otherwise gain an immunity by virtue of having had the disease. So there's a big opportunity here to make a big difference and to give people the opportunity to get back to work and feel comfortable doing so because they've got good, high quality, dependable, reliable childcare available to them. If we don't do this, then I'm fearful that we're going to continue having uh, a limitation on our workforce, and we're going to be continue. We're going to continue to have a lot more people on the sidelines than in the workforce. I want to remind everybody that it wasn't so long ago when participation rate in the labor force by women was down around 38 percent. 
If you go back to the 60s, that's what really was occurring back then. So to get up to uh, 60% or, or a little over 60%, which is where we were in 2001, um, is an enormous shift culturally and economically, and it contributes to and has contributed to the success of the economy over that period of time. But I think there's more to the story. We have to think about culturally. That's not for me to opine on here, but I do think it's important that we give people the option of participating in the workforce if they want to. And I think that it's a, an efficient way to do so because by allowing people to put that money directly into a health savings account uh, without taxation, streamlines the administrative attributes of this effort, meaning you don't have to apply for a tax refund or a tax or a, apply for a tax credit. Uh, and you don't have to wait a long period of time before that, ca that cash is available to you to use. Uh, it, this makes a lot more sense because it eliminates those administrative attributes to it and it also eliminates the delays that may be associated with getting either a track tax credit or a tax refund. So to me, it makes a lot more sense to do it up front, to have people put the money into the right account, to encourage savings, uh, to encourage uh, people to get back into the workforce, to encourage childcare in the right way, uh, and to give people opportunities uh, to participate in the workforce. Right now, we have a situation where we have far more jobs than we have workers. And part of the reason for that is because we have far too, pe far too few people in the workforce today. Again, our participation rate is down around 61 to 62%, which is uh, unfortunately far too low for what we need. I think the other thing we need to think about is the transition of the nature of work over time. We'll talk about that in another podcast, but I, I really wanna be focused today on just the issue of how do we expand health savings accounts to accommodate childcare and dependent care? If you can help me with this, that'd be great. Again, if you like this content, please uh, like, uh, share, and subscribe. Really appreciate your support. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching this week's episode of Civil Discourse. To learn more about today's topic or our guest, visit www.the60percentsolution.com or www.tfip.group.